When the gods found humans to be increasingly arrogant, they decided to wipe out all of humanity, but the Valkyrie Hilda stood up against them, suggesting Ragnarok, where humanity is given a chance, and their greatest heroes are summoned to fight for mankind's survival. With the help of her Valkyrie sisters, who transform into weapons known as the Volander, the heroes are given the power to oppose the gods. Despite this, humanity's heroes still lost the first two rounds against the gods, as Thor and Zeus proved to be too powerful. However, Kojiro Sasaki, the strongest swordsman was able to take out Poseidon in the third round. As Hilda and her sister Gaul consider the next match, they find out that the gods will be sending out Hercules. Although they are on different sides, they see him like a brother, and Hilda wishes him luck. Hercules gets approached by Loki, who wonders if he can really destroy humanity, since he is half-human himself. But Hercules tells him he will fight with everything he has for the gods, although he plans to petition against the destruction of humanity after he wins. The next round begins, and Hilda has chosen Jack the Ripper to fight for humanity. Hercules gets angry that he has to fight against a mass murderer, and even the crowd is conflicted about cheering for a serial killer. The arena is transformed into a section of London, and Jack shows off his divine weapon, a gigantic pair of scissors that can cut through anything. As Hercules prepares to fight, Jack runs away from him. He chases after him and finds Jack having some tea. He tells Jack to pick up his weapon and fight, but as Jack ignores him, Hercules approaches but runs into some tripwires, a trap is activated, and blades fall down on him, but he shrugs it off, saying human weapons aren't able to even scratch a god. Jack fires a grappling hook to get away, but Hercules jumps after him, swinging his club at Jack, who uses his scissors to block, but the scissors get shattered. Jack backs away from him, reaching for some more knives, but Hercules reminds him they are pointless against him. However, the knives end up stabbing into him. Hercules wonders how it's possible, and Jack reveals that he lied about his scissors, saying his divine weapon is actually his satchel, which he can use to create other divine weapons, as long as they can fit in the bag. Jack continues to throw knives, and Hercules bats them away, but there are some knives that land. Despite this, Hercules continues to push forward. As he swings his club, Jack assembles an umbrella, which he spins and diverts the attack. Jack taunts him, and Hercules activates one of his twelve labors as his tattoo grows and his club transforms, creating a lion-like shockwave that hits Jack and blows him into a building. Jack gets back up, snapping his dislocated shoulder back into place. The tattoos on Hercules spread all over his body, and Loki asks Ares, the god of war, about them. Ares explains that when Hercules completed the twelve labors and mastered the twelve divine arts, those powers came with a price, and each time he uses them, his tattoos spread, and every time they do, he feels unbearable pain that would be enough to knock out a normal god, and if the tattoos cover his whole body, then he will die. But Ares has faith in him, saying his will is so strong that even the gods couldn't break it. We see that thousands of years ago, there's a young boy Castor that's getting bullied. His friend Alcides tries to stand up for him, but also gets beaten up. Castor wonders why he tried to fight when he is so weak, but Alcides states that it was the right thing to do. Despite being a scrawny kid, he had the biggest heart and sense of justice. He trains as hard as he can, but the bullies mock him, saying that he should try drinking the blood of Zeus from the temple, because the legends say that if a true hero drinks it, they will become immortal. However, if they are not a true hero, they will instantly perish. Castor tells Alcides to not believe them as it's just a legend, Alcides says he is aware, although he wants to get strong, there is no point if he dies trying. He keeps on training, and over time, there came a point where there was no longer anyone who would make fun of him. During a council of the gods, they find that humans have become too wicked, so Ares is sent to wipe them all out. The humans are scared, but Alcides stands up to him. Ares easily kicks him away, but he stands up and faces him again. He decides to risk it all, drinking the blood of Zeus. He has a violent reaction to the blood and falls to the ground. As Ares continues forward, Alcides gets back up, having obtained a stronger body. The soldiers all charge at him, but Alcides defeats them all and goes toe-to-toe -to -toe fighting with Ares. Neither of them back down, but Zeus appears and stops the fight. He tells Alcides that he will become a god, since he will just cause trouble if he is left on earth. 
Alcides agrees on the condition that they swear they will never again cause harm to mankind, and for the next 4,000 years, the gods didn't interfere with Earth's affairs. Alcides took his place among the gods as a child of Zeus and was named after his wife, Hera, and became known as Hercules. Jack and Hercules continue their fight as Jack throws his blades and knives. He jumps around all over the place, but as Hercules approaches, Jack starts hopping in the air, and it turns out he set up wires while he was jumping around. Hercules wonders how many more tricks he has, and Jack throws knives in the air, and using the wires, he flings them with increased speed. The knives bounce all around, and Hercules struggles to defend himself. Hercules uses the sixth labor, transforming his club into a bird, creating a powerful wind that blows the knives back at Jack. Jack gets hit, and his monocle is destroyed, but this reveals Jack's special eye. He marvels at Hercules' unwavering will, seeing him with a brilliant light, and he wonders how his color will change when he meets his death. We see Jack as a boy, getting caught stealing food from the trash. He gets beaten by the honor, and Jack sees the man's aura as red, indicating malice and rage. But as he begs for food, the man's aura turns blue, which Jack recognizes as a color of superiority. Jack gets to leave with some food, and he heads home thinking his mother will be happy. He gets to the brothel where they live, and his mother sees that he's injured and quickly treats him. Jack sees her as the most beautiful person, seeing a brilliant golden aura. One day as Jack reads, one of the women at the brothel wonders why his mother decided to keep him since she aborted her previous five pregnancies. She pities him for having to grow up in such a situation, but Jack says he is happy, taking comfort in his mother's love. One day, as he is returning home with some food, he returns to find his mother crying over a newspaper article. She learned the man she was in love with had gotten married. He had promised to come back for her 13 years ago, and she is devastated. When Jack tries to comfort his mother, saying she still has him, she yells at him, saying he is worthless now and wishing she had aborted him. He realizes he was just a tool to connect her to the one she loved. Jack sees his mother's color turning red, he starts choking her, finding the color to be disgusting, and she turns purple. Realizing it's the color of fear, he finds it to be quite beautiful. His mother gets free, but Jack stabs her in the neck, saying she is the most beautiful she has ever been. Jack tells Hercules that when people die, it's a beautiful sight when they all turn to fear. But Hercules says that when he dies, there won't be a hint of fear in him, because the only thing he fears is the lack of justice. The two continue their fight, and Jack eventually gets cornered, with his back against Big Ben. Jack uses his grappling gun to get away, but Hercules knocks down the tower. Jack manages to hold on the clock arms, and Hercules prepares to use his seventh labor. The clock face detaches, and Jack throws it at Hercules. Hercules reminds him that he can't be hurt by mortal weapons, but as he tries to block it, his arm is sliced off. Jack says that he lied about his satchel being his divine weapon, revealing it was just a bluff to get Hercules to lower his guard and that his real divine weapon are his gloves. Using a pebble, he shows how anything he touches becomes a divine weapon. Ares is shocked, realizing that he has been touching everything, so the whole city has become a weapon. Ares starts freaking out, but he gets punched by Zeus, who reminds him of the kind of man that Hercules is. Ares pulls himself together and agrees that his best friend Hercules would never lose. Despite being cornered, Hercules shows no sign of fear. Hercules says that as both a human and a god, he can see the flaws of humanity, yet he still loves them. Jack sees the color of love from him, a color he never thought he would see again, and Hercules declares that he will save him as well. Hercules throws his club into the sky and activates his twelfth labor, Cerberus. The hounds descend onto him, and he is transformed with a demonic visage. Zeus states it's now a race against time, the labor is devastatingly powerful, but it comes at a high price. The labor will only end when it either devours his opponent or completely consumes him. The fight between the two becomes more intense and Hercules easily destroys anything that Jack throws at him. Despite being able to dodge a lot of the attacks, Jack shields himself with a manhole, but Hercules punches right through it and lands a hit. Jack tries to escape with his grappling hook, but Hercules jumps after him, punching him down, and Jack gets impaled on a metal fence. Jack cuts the metal piece and barely stands. Hercules tells him there is nowhere left to run, but Jack reminds him that all of London is his weapon. 
he cuts the building behind him, and as it falls, he bounces off of Hercules to get away, and Hercules is crushed by the building. The fight appears to be over, but Ares yells for Hercules to stand, and in that moment, Hercules emerges from the rubble, getting up once again. He tells Jack that no matter what he tries, his righteous heart won't be shaken. Jack thanks him, realizing that his mother's color was fake. He never knew that true love was so beautiful, but he still wants to turn him to fear. Jack takes a piece of wood and part of a door, turning them into divine weapons, and engages Hercules in close combat for the first time. Hercules smashes through his shield, and Jack is blown away. Jack goes back to avoiding the attacks, and Ares worries he is just buying time while Hercules' tattoos cover him. But Loki doesn't agree, pointing out all the blood Jack is losing, saying he also doesn't have much time. Jack continues dodging Hercules' attacks, waiting for a perfect timing. He pulls out the iron rod from the fence, but only manages to scratch him, and Hercules knocks him down. The gods start celebrating, but Jack starts singing London Bridge is falling down, and he slowly gets back up. He stumbles over to Hercules, trying to stab him once again, but Hercules punches him, and as he prepares for a finishing blow, Jack stabs him with his hands. Hercules realizes that he soaked his gloves with his blood, and turned his blood into a divine weapon. Realizing that he lost, he asks Jack about his color, and Jack tells him that his color is unchanged. Hercules is glad, hugging Jack, and reminding him that he will always love mankind. His soul proceeds to shatter, and the gods are left speechless. As he fades, he hopes Hilda is watching, saying that he leaves the rest to her to save the humans. Gaul cries for Hercules, and asks Hilda if she is happy that Jack killed him, but Hilda says she is doing what she must, in order to save humanity. Hilda goes into a room where she pays respect to the fallen heroes, and she adds another cup for Hercules. She starts crying, saying that she will join him when this is all over. As Ares mourns Hercules' death, Zeus is angered that they are now tied with humanity, two to two. He lets out his frustration, destroying their viewing area, and refuses to let humanity take the lead. We meet the god Buddha, as he sees Loki waiting for him. Buddha wonders if he is trying to pick a fight, but Loki just asks him about the Volander. He thinks it's strange that the Valkyrie have such a powerful technique. He accuses Buddha of using his powers to aid the humans, asking him if he's a traitor. Things are looking tense, and at that moment, the seven gods of fortune arrive, and they also want to deliver judgment on Buddha. One of them named Ebisu, tries to intimidate him, but Buddha isn't bothered. Ebisu tries to hit him, but he launches his lollipop to stop Ebisu's attack. The gods of fortune prepare for battle, with Loki joining their side. Buddha tells them to bring it on, unleashing his power. At that moment, Kojiro arrives, along with two other heroes of humanity. They take Buddha's side, preparing to fight the gods, but Zeus suddenly smashes the ground, breaking things up. Ebisu still wants to fight, but Odin unleashes a menacing aura, intimidating everyone, and they all decide to walk away. Zeus warns Buddha not to cause trouble, but Buddha laughs, saying he doesn't take orders from anyone. Meanwhile, Gaul apologizes to Hilda for her outburst, but Hilda tells her there's no need, saying they should work together for mankind. They visit the quarters of their next hero, where they see a massive man sleeping. Hilda wakes him up, telling him it's his turn to fight. The man gets up, and we meet Raiden Tamiman, mankind's greatest sumo wrestler. Raiden wonders if he'll be merging with Hilda, but she says there is someone more suitable for him. A giant woman named Thrud enters the room, introducing herself as his partner. Raiden is shocked seeing her, and Thrud wonders if he's disappointed seeing her appearance, but Raiden is actually pleased, saying she is perfect, and this makes her heart melt, as she turns into his divine weapon. We see the next fight is set in a sumo-themed arena, and Raiden is introduced as an undefeated sumo champion. His opponent arrives on Elephant, and we meet Shiva, the god of destruction. The fight begins, with Raiden instantly charging at Shiva, and drop-kicking him in his face. Shiva gets pushed back, but he quickly recovers. Raiden continues to attack, landing a punch, and he knocks Shiva to his knees. He wants to end things quickly, attacking with a knee strike, but Shiva blocks it, glad they are having a real fight. Raiden is pushed away, and Shiva grabs onto him, smashing his chest, and launching him into the air. Raiden lands on his feet, and Shiva is happy to see he is a worthy opponent. In a flashback, we see a three-year-old Raiden, as his parents wonder what's wrong with him, because he can't even stand. 
One day, while his parents are preparing supper, they are surprised to see him standing, but his legs are shaking. His parents are overjoyed to see this, but as he takes a step, Raiden suddenly feels pain, and his parents watch in horror as his body falls apart. All the bones in his body are broken, but we learn it's because his muscles were just too powerful for his bones. Despite this, Raiden tried his best to walk, and he eventually managed to do it, as his body produced even more muscles to restrain his power, creating a shell, which was known as the Hundred Seals. Back in the present, Raiden slaps himself, and unlocks his Hundred Seals. His muscles start to go berserk, and Shiva wonders if he's going to destroy himself. But he calls on Thrud to help him out, and he is able to put his muscles under control. We learn that the lines on his body are actually his volunteer, and it gives him total control over his muscles. Gaul becomes shocked realizing Raiden became the strongest while his power was restricted by his hundred seals. Raiden's body stabilizes, and he charges at Shiva, punching with all of his might. Shiva is blown away, and he feels the difference in Raiden's power. Everyone cheers for Raiden, and Shiva seems to be barely standing. Raiden tries to finish him off with a headbutt, but Raiden is the one who ends up taking damage. Shiva counterattacks, punching him away, as he reveals his head is as hard as stone. Shiva starts attacking him with a flurry of attacks, and all Raiden can do is block. Raiden takes some damage, but he grabs onto Shiva's arm, and he uses his brute strength to crush it instantly. Shiva kicks him away, and everyone sees his broken arm. The gods tremble, but the Indian gods know Shiva better, and they cheer him on. Shiva hears them cheering for him, and we learn he has never let his friends down. Shiva realizes he is fighting for their sake as well, so he gets fired up, charging at Raiden, and his punch seems to have gotten stronger. We learn that his fists have the power of over a thousand Indian gods behind them, and Raiden tries to fight back, but Shiva hits him with a devastating blow, making him cough blood, as Shiva attacks with his head. Raiden doesn't back down, countering with his own headbutt, and the two keep smashing their heads together. In a flashback, we learn that the Indian gods were fighting each other, to determine who would rule over them. During that time, Shiva and his friend Rudra were just unknown gods, living carefree lives. But their territory is attacked by another group of gods. They go out to confront them, but they get laughed at as the gods think they are nobodies. However, they end up beating those gods, and after the fight, Rudra tells Shiva about his dream to stand at the pinnacle of India, wanting to see things no one else has ever seen. He tells Shiva to join him, saying they can go anywhere if they work together, and Shiva decides to go with him, thinking it will be fun. Together, they beat the other gods, and with every god they defeated, they would gain their strength, but it would also increase their responsibility. They eventually go up against the god named Indra, who is said to be ten times stronger than the other gods. Rudra fights him alone, and he eventually comes out on top. They dance together to celebrate their victory, and they later reach the top, having defeated all of the other gods. However, at the pinnacle, Rudra tells him they need to fight, because only one god can stand at the top. Shiva doesn't want to do it, but Rudra insists, so they end up fighting. They trade blows, in what is now known as the most ferocious fight in the history of India, and Shiva eventually gains the advantage. Rudra refuses to give up, reminding Shiva about his dream, so Shiva decides to throw the fight, but just as he is about to admit defeat, Rudra beats him to it, knowing he lost to Shiva. Rudra tells Shiva not to go easy on an opponent who's going all out, and Shiva gains the name of Rudra, making him the chief of all the Indian gods. Back in the present, Shiva starts dancing to the rhythm of the cosmos, and the other gods recognize it as the war dance which he used to unite the Indian gods. Shiva moves erratically, dodging Raiden's punch. Raiden strengthens his legs, trying to attack again, but Shiva easily dodges and kicks him away. Shiva proceeds to give him a beating, and Raiden appears to be helpless against the assault. But he pumps up his forearms, creating a massive meat shield to block all of Shiva's attacks. Shiva's dance sets his body on fire, and he continues to pound Raiden with his burning fists. Shiva manages to break through his shield, as he strikes with his leg, burning Raiden's body. Everyone thinks mankind is about to lose, but Raiden suddenly smiles, as he realizes he can fight his opponent with all his might. In a flashback, we see a five-year-old Raiden, as he has a sumo match with his senior. He easily defeats his senior, and Raiden celebrates his victory, but his senior is injured, and everyone starts seeing him as a monster. 
He asks his mother why he isn't like the other kids, but his mother tells him his strength is a gift from the gods, so he must use it to help the weak. After that, Raiden grew up as a good man, and he is supposed to stay in his village, but one day, a volcano erupted, destroying all of the crops and causing a famine. Raiden knows the people are suffering, so at the age of 17, he leaves the village and goes to Edo, planning to become a sumo wrestler to earn money for his village. He enters a dojo, where the trainer tells him to have a match, but he refuses, not wanting to hurt the other wrestlers. But a wrestler named Ozaki challenges him, telling him to go home if he loses, so he accepts the fight. Raiden immediately charges at his opponent, but Ozaki is able to stop him, and he gets thrown to the side. Raiden is shocked by this, but he keeps charging at Ozaki, who keeps beating him up. As Raiden lies on the ground, Ozaki asks him what he thinks about Sumo, and Raiden discovers his love for Sumo. After that, Raiden devotes himself to learning Sumo, and one day, he has his first match, where he easily throws his opponent out of the ring. He goes on to overpower other wrestlers with a single move, turning him into a living legend. He feeds the people in his hometown, and everyone starts looking up to him, but during one of his matches, he realizes that his opponent is afraid of him. This makes him remember the time he hurt his senior, so he ends up throwing the match. Ozaki asks him why he did this, but he sees Raiden crying, as he realizes he is using his powers to bully the weak. To prevent himself from injuring his opponents, he stops using his four strongest sumo moves, but despite this, he goes on to win more than 95% of his matches, and he only lost fights when he threw against much weaker opponents. Back in the present, Raiden assumes an unusual stance, stomping his foot, as he prepares to use his palm thrust. He flexes his leg muscles, as he jumps toward Shiva, transferring all of his strength to his hand, as he unleashes his technique. Shiva tries to block it, but he gets blown away, and even loses two of his arms. Everyone thinks humanity has won, but Shiva gets back up. Raiden suddenly takes damage, and Gaul wonders what's going on. Hilda explains that Raiden's technique puts strain on his body, and his body is being ripped apart, but his Volander is holding him together. Thrud is worried about him, but Raiden tells her to move his muscles even faster. He knows it won't be good for his body, but he wants to put his full might into Sumo, so Thrud lends him her powers, as she decides to support him. Shiva feels a gust of wind, as he sees Rudra watching his fight. He is happy to see him in the arena, along with the other Indian gods who believe in him, so he becomes determined not to lose. Shiva stabs himself in the chest, grabbing his heart and forcing it to beat faster, causing fire to surround his body as he transforms into his ultimate form. The two charge at each other, exchanging blows, as Shiva uses his burning legs to attack Raiden, burning his muscles. Hilda knows Raiden is at a disadvantage, because he will lose muscle as the fight drags on, but Hermes notes that Shiva's technique is just as dangerous, and it could end up burning his body away. Shiva attacks Raiden from behind, and Raiden tries to grab onto him, enduring the flames, but Shiva counters, kicking him in the head. The other sumo wrestlers start to lose hope, but Ozaki points out Raiden is still on his feet, fighting for all of sumo, so they cheer him on. This gives Raiden more power, as he charges at Shiva with his head, knocking him down. Shiva gets back up but his body starts falling to pieces, so the Indian gods realize he's close to his limit. However, they know that Raiden is in a similar situation, so the fight has become an endurance contest. The two clash, and the crowd goes wild as they exchange blows. With both fighters fighting for something bigger than themselves, they are putting everything on the line for this fight, but they both approach their limit. Raiden prepares to use his palm thrust again, and Shiva tells him to bring it on. They charge at each other with their ultimate skills, but Shiva's attack overpowers Raiden, ripping his arm apart. He thanks Shiva for allowing him to use all of his might, as he tells Thrud to release his Volander, but she chooses to stay with him, saying she has fallen for him. Raiden admits he had a great time, and Shiva finishes him off. He thanks Raiden for giving him the greatest fight ever, and as he walks away, Raiden's soul proceeds to shatter. As Shiva leaves the arena, he encounters Rudra, who catches him as he falls. Zeus approaches him, saying he's in bad shape, as Shiva admits he almost lost, saying humans are awesome, and Zeus laughs as he agrees with him. Meanwhile, Gaul mourns the death of Thrud, asking Hilda why they are going so far to save mankind. Hilda adds Raiden's cup to the altar of fallen heroes, saying they are now 2-3 against the gods. 
She gets emotional, but she is determined to save mankind. We see Zeus approaching a tree, where he finds Buddha eating some chocolates. He wants to have one, but Buddha won't let him have any, and he eats all of the chocolates at once. Zeus asks him to fight in the next match, saying he doesn't like losing. He threatens Buddha with his aura, but Buddha quickly calls him the boss, and he tells him to enjoy the show. We see Buddha as he enters the arena. He grabs onto the announcer's horn, and he declares he will be fighting on the side of mankind. The gods think he has gone mad, but Buddha claims that if the gods are willing to save mankind, then it's up to him to do it. Gaul is confused, asking Hilda why Buddha is fighting on their side, wondering if this is part of her plan, but Hilda claims Buddha doesn't take orders from anyone. We see that just before the round, Buddha approached her, after she just mourned for Raiden. Buddha tells her that he wants to fight for humanity, but she isn't surprised. He asks her if things are going according to her plan, because she asked him about his powers before Ragnarok began, so he thinks she's been scheming to get him to fight the gods. Hilda denies this, as she points out that everyone knows he hates the gods. This makes him laugh, but he warns her that he doesn't take kindly to being manipulated, before walking away. We return to the arena, where the announcer tells Buddha that he can't switch sides, but Zeus says he doesn't mind, revealing that Buddha isn't breaking any of the rules. Odin asks Buddha if he is prepared to be the enemy of all gods, but he doesn't care, saying he's the only thing that matters, making all the other gods mad. Buddha asks Zeus who he's going to fight, and light comes out of the sky, as a ship descends on the arena. The seven gods of fortune make their entrance. The announcer says that only one of them can fight. Their leader reveals that they are actually one being, as he removes his armor. His companions enter his body, and a bright light surrounds him, creating a sphere, which shatters as a god named Zero appears. Zero wants to slaughter Buddha, as he warms up his body, but Buddha doesn't seem to care. His back bulges, and he pulls out his weapon, as he prepares to fight. Gaul thinks it's not fair for seven gods to combine into one, but Hilda calls it his true form, revealing that he used to be a good god that wanted to spread fortune, but he ended up being changed by sorrow. In a flashback, we see Zero going to the city, where he sees the people suffering. It makes him cry, and he wonders what he can do to make them happy. He thinks about removing the source of their misfortune to make them happy, so he goes to a boy, touching him with his hand, and absorbing his misfortune. The boy instantly feels better, and the people start worshipping Zero. He continues to absorb the misfortune of other people, but after several years, he has absorbed too much, and it takes a toll on his body. He returns to the city, wanting to see how the people are doing, but he discovers the true nature of humanity as the people fall into depravity without misfortune. A man bumps into him, causing him to fall to the ground, and Zero recognizes the man as the boy he helped years ago. He asks the man how he's doing, but the man doesn't even remember him, telling him to get lost. Zero can't believe that any of this is real, thinking about everything he's done for them, and wondering why the people are still unhappy. At that moment, Buddha arrives with his disciples. Zero notes that Buddha's disciples looked shabby and poor, but he wonders why they looked so happy, unlike the people in the city. Zero calls out to Buddha, asking him why his followers look so fortunate, because he absorbed the misfortune of humans, but he only made them worse. Buddha tells him that fortune can't be given, and that it must be obtained, saying there is shadow where there is light, and tells Zero to join him to achieve enlightenment. Zero cries as he runs away, feeling jealous, because despite being a human, Buddha was able to make people more fortunate, knowing that it's supposed to be his job. As he mourns by a river, a dark energy suddenly surrounds him, and his love transforms into hate, turning him into the Zero that he is now. Three people see him in the woods, and they immediately run away, as he chases after them. He is about to kill a woman, but she stops, shielding her baby. This causes Zero to hesitate, and he resists the urge to kill, dividing himself into the seven gods of fortune. Back in the present, Zero thinks it's his time to punish Buddha, but Buddha suddenly kicks him, knocking him to his knees, as Buddha reminds him that the fight has already begun. Zero gets back up, attacking with his axe, but Buddha easily evades thanks to his special eyes. Zero becomes angry, swinging his axe wildly, but Buddha dodges every attack. Zero becomes frustrated, and his axe seems to grow in size. Zeus reveals that Zero's axe absorbs misfortune, and it gets stronger the more it absorbs. Hilda adds that Zero's inability to hit Buddha counts as misfortune to him, so he will get stronger as the fight drags on. 
Gaw is impressed by Buddha's ability to dodge, moving before Zero even attacks, and we learn that his eyes give him the power of precognition. Zero continues to miss, asking Buddha if he's mocking him, and Buddha suddenly counter-attacks. Buddha taunts him, making him even angrier, and Buddha proceeds to give him a beating. The battle appears one-sided, but Zero suddenly remembers his past misfortunes, and he unleashes a powerful aura. The axe absorbs his misfortunes, and it becomes ridiculously massive. Zero swings his axe at Buddha, but Buddha stands his ground, activating his staff. The axe obliterates everything in the area, but Buddha's staff transformed into a shield, protecting him from the attack. Hilda reveals that Buddha's staff is a divine treasure, which contains the power of the six realm guardians in Buddhism, and it changes its form depending on Buddha's emotions. Buddha pushes the axe back, as Zero transforms it into a serrated sword. Buddha's weapon takes the form of a club, and it signals him to charge in, so he dashes at Zero, dodging his attack as he lands a hit. In a flashback, we learn that Buddha was born as a prince of a royal family in ancient India, and he had everything a man could ever wish for. One evening, his father the king, tells him about his destiny to become the king of the world. He helps feed the people in his kingdom, telling them it's the duty of royalty to bring fortune to the people. One day, he meets up with his distant relative, King Jataka, and they talk about Buddha's destiny to become the king. Buddha thinks Jataka is happy, because the kingdom is prosperous, but Jataka reveals that he isn't fortunate, because he's suffering from a life-threatening disease, and his entire life, he has done nothing but serve the people, so he has no idea what the outside world is like. Jataka eventually passes away, and everyone mourns his death, thinking he lived a happy life, but Buddha knows this wasn't the case, and at that moment, Buddha thinks about his life, and how his fortune was given to him. He gets off his horse, and starts laughing, saying he has been enlightened. He goes to Jataka's funeral, where he throws flowers everywhere, and he takes Jataka's casket. Everyone condemns his behavior, but he doesn't care what they think, because Jataka doesn't need their prayers, saying true fortune is found within. He takes Jataka's remains to the river, where he leaves his casket floating, and he leaves everything behind to go on a journey into the wilderness. He finds a group of men trying to achieve enlightenment by starving themselves, and one of them has collapsed from hunger. Their leader claims that it's the only way to purify the mind, but Buddha gives the man some food, telling him to eat. The leader condemns his actions, but Buddha doesn't care, saying he wants to feed the man. The group starts following Buddha instead, and he teaches them to lie down and chill, instead of starving themselves. One evening, a girl is about to be sacrificed to the gods, but Buddha saves her. The worshippers worry about the wrath of God, but Buddha tells them he would gladly fight the gods. Hilda notes that Buddha despises anyone who tries to force destiny on others, or deprive them of inner happiness, so this is the reason he's fighting the gods. Zero twists his weapon, transforming it into two swords, while Buddha turns his divine treasure into a poleaxe. They proceed to exchange blows, but Buddha has the advantage with his precognition. Zero ends up getting slashed, but this just makes him angrier, as his weapon transforms once again. His blades approach Buddha, but Buddha's weapon takes the form of a knife, and he is able to destroy the blades. He manages to close the distance, and their weapons clash, as the crowd starts cheering for Buddha. Zero becomes upset nobody pays attention to him, just like in his past, and he suddenly extends his weapon, almost hitting Buddha. Buddha tells him he needs to love himself, but Zero calls it nonsense, trying to attack him. Buddha claims he has taken a liking to him. Zero thinks he's lying, but he looks at Buddha, and sees the sincere look on his face. This makes him realize that he just wanted to be like Buddha, who is loved by everyone, as his weapon slowly loses power. Buddha throws his weapon away, saying he wants to fight hand to hand. They start fighting each other, as Zero realizes that Buddha is the one who understands him the most, finally feeling happy, as Buddha knocks him down with a punch. The crowd cheers for Buddha, and Zero's misfortune leaves his body, allowing him to return to his true form, wanting to make people happy again. However, his horns suddenly return to his head, causing him pain, and two dragons come out of his body. They encircle him, forming a sphere, and a massive demon emerges from it. Buddha jumps away, unable to read its movements, and he wonders what's going on. The demon explains that Zero is no more, and he introduces himself as Papias, the demon king. Buddha wonders what he wants, and Papias isn't sure, but says he wants to test out his power. 
Ares asks Hermes about Papias, but even he doesn't know anything. Hades suddenly joins them, saying Papias isn't a god, as Ares quickly gives up his chair for him. Hades reveals that Papias is a legendary berserker from the underworld, which is where the damned run rampant. He tells them that despite being the king of the underworld, he has never seen Papias before, and he wonders why a god would turn into him. Buddha starts fighting with Papias, but it seems he can no longer predict his movements. Hilda notes that Buddha's eyes allow him to see the flickers of the soul, which moves before the body, but Papias' soul is total darkness, so he can't see anything. Papias decides to fight with his full power, flexing his arm, as he turns his weapon into a drill. He charges at Buddha, who tries to defend with his shield, but the drill penetrates right through, taking out Buddha's eye. Papias is impressed he was able to dodge the attack, because he was aiming for the head. He transforms his arm into an axe, and he continues his assault. They continue to exchange blows, and Buddha ends up taking another hit. Ares wonders how Papias is so strong, and Hades states that no ordinary god can hold a candle to him. He reveals that Papias once destroyed half of the underworld, and the destruction only stopped because he suddenly vanished. This occurred centuries ago, long before Hades became the king, and he never believed that story. He thinks Papias is there, because someone must have obtained a fragment of him, and created something like a seed, which was then planted on zero. Ares wonders who would do such a thing, and Hades thinks there's only one god who would enjoy such a thing. Hermes knows he's talking about Beelzebub, who would have done it just to see what would happen, saying anyone could have been the vessel. Buddha tries to counterattack, but he gets stabbed in the foot. He falls back, but his injuries are starting to take a toll on him. He calls on Zero, thinking he's still somewhere inside, but Papias laughs, saying he has already consumed Zero and turned him into nourishment. Buddha declares he will kill Papias, as he feels hatred for the first time in centuries, causing his weapon to transform into a scythe. Papias is unfazed, eager to take him on, and Buddha strikes first, but Papias manages to block his attack. Buddha pushes him back, creating an opening, and his scythe expels fire, to boost his speed, as he tries to finish him off. However, Papias ends up blocking it with his arm, and Buddha is the one who gets stabbed. Papias wonders if he has any last words, but Buddha gets closer, saying he'll be the one to save mankind. Papias finds him dangerous, kicking him away, and Buddha is badly injured, but he refuses to give up, calling Papias a chicken. Papias tells him to know his place, saying he has become a supreme being, because unlike before, when his body couldn't handle his strength, he now has a stronger vessel, so he's confident in his power. Buddha calls him weak, saying that he is even weaker than Zero. Papias charges at him, telling him to prove it, as he launches an assault on Buddha. Ares wonders if this is the end of Buddha, but Hades tells him to look at Buddha's eye, because he still hasn't given up, and Zeus knows he's just waiting for a chance to turn the tables. Buddha gets knocked back, but he stays on his feet, and Papias wonders how he's still standing. Buddha tells him to bring it on, which scares Papias as his hands start shaking. He refuses to accept this, ripping off his arm to conquer his fear, and he turns it into a sword. Buddha charges with his scythe, but Papias counters with his own skill, breaking the scythe. The weapon returns to its original form, and Papias rushes at him, ultimately destroying Buddha's staff. It looks like the end for Buddha, and Papias goes in for the kill, but at that moment, he gets a vision where he sees light behind him. As he reaches out to it, there's a hand that grabs onto him. Buddha regains consciousness, and he suddenly starts laughing. Papias thinks he has lost his mind, but as Buddha gets back up, he says he has overcome his immaturity. His hairband breaks, causing him to take on a new appearance, and he takes Zero's weapon, telling Zero they will fight together, as he activates the Volander technique. Hilda cries as she realizes the weapon is absorbing Buddha's love instead of misfortune, turning it into a new divine treasure. The weapon takes the form of a strange sword, and it has the power of the seven gods of fortune. Buddha goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Papias, and humanity cheers for him with everything they have. Their desires flow into him, giving him strength, as Papias wonders how he can keep fighting despite his condition. Buddha parries his attack, and they both land an attack on each other. Kojiro thinks the odds are against Buddha, because he has just taken too much damage. Papias attacks with his skill, damaging Buddha as he blocks it, but Buddha manages to parry, creating an opening, and he lands a counterattack. Papias can't believe his strongest attack was stopped, 
but we see the gods saying that Buddha won't be able to block the attack again. However, Hades says he just needs to dodge. We see Papias launching a barrage of attacks, but it seems Buddha can now dodge. Because of Papias' fear, Buddha can now see the flickers of his soul, allowing him to dodge the attacks. Papias becomes frustrated, unable to land a hit, so he uses his ultimate skill, slicing Buddha in half. Everyone is shocked seeing this, and Papias thinks he has finally won, but Buddha's body disappears, and he reappears behind him. He lands a decisive blow, slicing Papias into pieces, as humanity celebrates the victory. Papias refuses to accept defeat, trying to attack Buddha, but before he can hit him, his soul shatters. Buddha sees Zero's soul smiling at him, as he joins the seven gods of fortune, ascending to the sky, and Buddha says farewell to him. Buddha is announced as the winner of the match, and humanity cheers for him as he leaves the arena. Hilda and Gaul rush to him, celebrating his victory, but he suddenly collapses from his injuries. He receives medical attention, and he reminds Hilda not to be so serious all the time. Meanwhile, the gods realize that the score is even once again, so Zeus says they must win the next match no matter what. Hades volunteers to fight, shocking them all, but he says he will avenge his brother Poseidon. Gaul freaks out as she learns about this, saying there's no human that can defeat Hades. Hilda selects humanity's next hero, saying there's only one man capable of going against the king of the underworld, and she reveals that that person is none other than mankind's first king. But that's where this video ends. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.